In Maya LTE, you have the ability to view your game assets directly in the Maya viewport in DirectX 11. You also have the ability to load HLSL uh, or .fx files to see those shaders in the viewport, game shaders that may have been created elsewhere. But you also, in addition to that, have the ability to author game shaders using the new shader effects tool set. So what you'll notice here, if I take a look at this, the assets in the scene, I have a gun here, and if I take a look at the shader, this is actually using the built-in DX11 shader. Uh, it's actually a plugin, but you can load .fx files directly into this, and basically, based on that description, it will load all of the associated parameters uh, for that shader. Now, you also have the ability to author these types of shaders. So if you'll take a look at the background here, and actually, let me just hide uh, some of the rest of the environmental assets. And we'll pull, um, pull into the backpack. And what you'll notice that's a little bit different about this is the type of shader that's associated with this. So here, I've got a few parameters that have been essentially published on this shader. And I have the ability to dive into what's called shader FX. So this is an F SFX shader file. If I open shader effects, what you'll see is I have a node uh, graph, a node structure that defines the look of the shader. So now we can start to pull in and we can start to see the parameters on the shader itself, which has standard inputs like opacity, ambience, diffuse, reflection, and so on. And then upstream from that, all of the various uh, utility nodes, math nodes, texture nodes, whatever they may be, in order to drive the look of the shader. So we also get visual feedback, and what you can see is one of the nodes in here is highlighted in bright red. The bright red indicates that the node has an error or is missing some kind of information. So we'll talk a little bit about how we can go in and create some uh, effects on this shader. So let's pull my graph off to the side here, and I'll just make my channel box a little smaller there, or rather my attribute editor. And now we'll pull in, and we'll see here that I have a glow, which is ultimately feeding into the ambient parameter of my surface shader. So what I want to do is figure out what the problem is. And what the problem is, just by looking, is that the glow is taking in information upstream from a specific texture, and then it looks like it's being composited or added to um, another texture in order to create a certain effect. So what I'm noticing just by looking at the backpack is that a glow is missing for the exhaust of the rocket booster. So what I want to do is add that. I'm going to right click here and if I right click in the background I can create some new hardware shader nodes and you can see I've got a variety of types, lighting, math, uh, patterns, textures, and so on. So I want to go in this case into my texture section and I want to create a texture map. Now this texture map allows me uh, just as with Maya, to basically go in and load this directly, uh, or rather load a, a texture directly into this. So now I just want to, want to basically go to my file browser and find the texture that I'm missing. So we'll just go into my source images. I have a jetpack section here, and what I'm clearly missing is the actual glow, which you can see right here. So I'm going to load up the glow into the texture. You can see that updates the swatch. And now I could composite this directly into the add glow, and what you'll see is if I refresh my viewport just by touching it, now it will actually update with a little bit of glow there around the rocket boosters. The problem is I don't have enough intensity in that glow. So I could go back to the original texture, or I may want to give the artist control in Maya over how how much intensity is associated with this particular glow effect. So let's make a little more room here. I have to juggle this a bit just because of the recording resolution. But what I want to do is actually break this connection and then go in and modify the red value of that. So I'm going to go into my hardware shader nodes and what I want to do is go in and do a simple multiply. So I'll go into the math section and I'll find the multiply node which is just out of screen recording view here but I'll generate that and then I'll feed the red color into one input value. And Now you can see this highlighted red value means that I need another value to multiply that with. So the multiply doesn't actually have the value on it. All I have to do is go in and create another node which contains the value. So now I'll go into my value section and I want to create a simple float. So I'll just create a simple float value, which is just a number, and then I'll basically feed that into the next input. And now I'll just take all of this and feed it into the glow, but what you'll notice is that I've basically taken a float value, extracted it from a vector. Now I need to combine that back into a vector. This is easily done through shader effects, and again, I'll just add a few additional nodes here. So I'll come in here and go to my hardware shader nodes section, and this time I want to go into math, and I want to, sorry, 
want to go into value, my mistake, and I want to go into a vector construct. And what that will allow me to do is basically take a bunch of float values and construct them into a vector, which is what is needed by the add float. So now I'll take the result of this, I'll feed it into the X, which is equivalent to R. Now I'll feed green into Y. Now I'll feed blue into Z. Now that composites all that into a vector and I can extract the vector from this. I want a vector three. I'll take the blue, which indicates that it's a three value vector, feed that into the value for the glow. And now just like that, I have a very simple multiplier on my jetpack. So if I pull back here a little bit, and actually let's just go back into the uh, full view here. And what you can see here is if I grab this float value and essentially just go back in, it's a little hard to get to with the screen resolution. Let's try that one more time. Go into the float value and I just add a two to that and then just touch the viewport, that'll update. And now you can see I've got a much more intense rocket exhaust. Just to exaggerate that a little bit, more, I'll grab the float value and I'll make that something like five and then you can really see the glow start to impact uh, or rather the value start to impact the glow of the shader in that particular area. So let's take a look at one more example of a cool effect that we can uh, create using shader effects. So let's actually just frame it on this crosswalk section here and I'll just bring my background back in just so I can kind of use that as a reference for the transparency. And what I want to do now is actually start to add some animation to this using shader effects. So if I play this back, you can see there's no animation in my scene. So I'm actually scrubbing the timeline there. It's a little hard for you guys to see there. I'll make the timeline visible. But you can see there's no animation. So what I want to do is grab this object, go into the attribute editor, and you can see I've got the platform and I've got the glass. The platform is the metallic parameter. The glass is the interior transparent section. So I'm going to open up shader effects and we'll take a look at this and what you can see is for the glass I've got a moderately complex shading network but nothing nothing too fancy. If I pull in you can see here I've got standard things like opacity, ambient, uh, diffuse color, reflection, normal and so on. So if I go upstream here you can see that the normal map uh, is feeding into the normal with a simple value associated with that. So if I were to go in and grab the value for instance um, you can see here that I can basically start to tweak the value. Let's put it up to a value of 1. And by doing that, you can see that I've added a little bit of uh, intensity to the normal map. So let's go back over here and look upstream also from Specular. Specular has a composite of a simple color and a texture map, basically, which is kind of like a noise pattern. So I want to make some animation for both of these and I can do this directly in the shader effects UI. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in here and go to the hardware shader nodes and under textures I have something called, it's a little bit hard for you to see there, I'll actually pull this up so you can see it. Let's create this right here. Uh, under textures I'll create either a UV planer or a UV rotator. We'll start with UV rotator and all that does is it gives me a utility for rotating the existing UVs or the texture relative to the existing UVs. So I simply attach the rotate out into the UV in of the normal map and now when I come back over here and I play this I should see some results. Now you can start to see that those uh, no, the normal map is indeed rotating around a specific point. So I've got a center X and Y value and I've got a speed. So let's actually give myself a few more frames to work with, say 500, and I'll set this speed to be at about 10% or about 0.1. So now you can see I'm getting a really slow rotation of these texture maps across the span of my object. So let's bring shader effects back into view here and let's just do the same thing with the uh, specular texture map, although this kind of time I'll do instead a UV planar, which is just going to move it kind of left to right or top to bottom. So I'll take the pan, sorry not planar, panner, I'll take the uh, pan and I'll feed that into the UVs, grab this node and the node itself you can see has a speed value associated with U or V. I'll actually just set that to zero for U and I'll set it to one for V and now you can see I'm getting two looks composited. So it's a little hard to see there, but I've got one going across and one going around. Now I can go in and I can increase the speed of that and I can see it's going to start going a little faster. If I bump it up to something like 20, you'll really start to see the influence of that. So that's just showing you a really, really simple effect that you can create with shader effects that basically allows the artist a little bit of visual control over the look and feel of your, of your shaders. Now if we take a, a deeper dive into this, 
what you'll notice if I look at the shading network is that this appears to be just a singular node that that appears to be kind of like a my utility node where it's just a single node but in reality this is actually made up of a bunch of other subnodes which we can't see right now if I right click on this I can go into what's called advanced mode and in advanced mode you can see that this is actually a composite or a compound of a bunch of other stuff so if I click on this box here that will expand the view of this node and now you can see I have the in and I have the out and then this is all the stuff that's happening in the middle so I have a time node I have a UV set node uh, and then I have a couple of other things going on in here but you can see that anytime I see one of these nodes with this little icon on it it means I can dive into that contents of that node and I can see how it's actually made so another example would be if I go up here here's the ambient sky ground I'll pull into that and you can see this one's much more complex with a bunch of math nodes values and and, and so on added and and, and multiplied and layered um, and without going into too much detail um, you get the basic idea. So if I click on exit group then it takes me up to the higher level. Now the one advantage to this also is that you can use it organizationally at, as a way of basically consolidating all related nodes within a, a sub network into one place but you can also use it as a way of saving out the node structure so that you can reuse it in other scenarios. So I could take my ambient ground sky composite here group we call it and I can basically go in here and I can export it so I can essentially export this to a file and then I can re-import it into another scene and basically get the same node network in the other scene with the same inputs and same outputs so if I take this kind of complex node structure that has been built in shader effects and uh, now I want to actually use this in game I can actually convert this into a targeted uh, hardware shader format. So if I go to the end of this graph I'll have a material node and if I grab that material node and load that in the attribute editor if you look here at the bottom I have the ability to export this or save this to disk as a hardware shader. So I'm actually just going to take this and I'm going to put it on my desktop and I'll just create uh, something called a test uh, FX file or test shader rather and then I choose the format that I want to export so I could choose GLSL or I could choose HLSL or I could choose CGFX so let's just choose two examples I'll do a GLSL shader I'll save that to disk and then I'll switch this over into HLSL and I've got different versions of HLSL I'm not going to worry about that for now but now I'll export that and now what I've done is I've created two text files that are descriptors uh, to basically recreate this same effect so now let's open those up and we'll just set them side by side to compare. This is actually the GLSL version and I'll put that right there and if I open up the FX or HLSL version I can put that right there and you can see that there are very different structures, very different formats but they're descriptors for essentially the same look and same effect that I was creating with the shader effects uh, node based UI. Now these could be loaded into hardware shaders for instance the HLSL file could be loaded into a hardware FX shader and viewed in Maya as well assuming we had the correct texture paths and so on. So that pretty much wraps up uh, the demonstration on shader effects. It's uh, very powerful so it will allow people to be really creative uh, on the shader authoring front.